Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic graph theory. Uh, today I would like to wrap up the first part on the spectrum. Not really, we'll see, still see the spectrum, but I still feel like it's time for some applications of the spectrum. The spectrum is absolutely fabulous. It loses a little bit of information. It doesn't remember the graph, right? I showed you some co-spectral graphs, so graphs of the same spectrum, which are not the same. But the slogan here, at least for today, is the spectrum knows a lot about the graph. And what is the advantage of the spectrum if it loses some information, you might ask? Well, it's just really easy to compute. You just do it and you kind of know facts about your graph, which you usually don't get super easily because you need to do some brute force or some search or some, we'll, we'll see, we'll see some examples. Um, yeah, so let's get started. So I hope to convince you that the spectrum, if I haven't yet, that the spectrum is actually a pretty, pretty great. Um, so let's have a look at applications. So all of the applications stay in mass for now. I will have uh, formal applications, formal, sorry, uh, application in the real world later. Um, but in this video, all applications stay in mass, which is kind of fair enough. Actually, they stay in graph theory itself, which is also fair enough. We will have more applications as we go. But for now, I would like to tell you a little bit about characterizing graphs, which is my first application. So here I have two graphs. Um, and I've marked the, the spectrum underneath them. That's kind of the slogan for uh, this talk uh, anyway. So I will always have a graph and a spectrum. Uh, so here, this graph has three, then five times one, and then four times minus two, a three, one, minus one, minus three. And I will always have the spectrum ordered exactly in this way. So the biggest one to the left, and then it successively gets smaller. Okay, so that's just, just setting up notation, and now we can go. So here are two examples, kind of the easiest ones, there are more, of how the spectrum can characterize graphs. And I will do the calculation for you. Also, that's a bit tricky um, because I'm not really good at calculations. Hopefully this will work out for you in a second. Okay, so for example, let's do the second one first, the one in purple. So bipartite means you can color it with two colors such that adjacent edges get different colors. So I already have a coloring for both of these graphs. And you could convince yourself, it's not so easy to convince yourself, but you can do it, but just, just brute force, that this is the minimal coloring. So in particular, this needs three colors and this needs two colors. So this is bipartite and this is not bipartite. This is just now easy to check for you because I just gave you the answer. But if you have a graph which is not colored and you need to find colors, it might not be super easy. But here comes a cool way of just doing it. Uh, without brute force trying to find colorings, because the graph is bipartite, if and only if, um, if, as we could see it here, let me just do it this way. You have this nice symmetry along the spectrum. So if lambda appears, minus lambda appears with same multiplicity. So, and here you can see, for example, three uh, is going nowhere. So this one is not bipartite. It's really simple to check. It's beautiful. And you don't need to worry about trying to color your graph. You can just know it from the spectrum. So calculating the spectrum is that kind of an algorithm. You only need to know the eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix. I mean, that is a just ridiculously fabulous, right? You save you a lot of trouble, a lot of work doing it by just reading off the spectrum. And you have this palindromic symmetry uh, of the eigenvalues. An absolutely fabulous result. Quite easy to prove. So this is one of my favorites. And um, the other one, for example, is another characterization. As I said, you have plenty of those. K regular means every edge has the same number of, out, uh, of adjacent uh, vertices, exactly the other way around. Every vertex has the same number of adjacent edges. So here K is three. You can convince yourself that every vertex has three adjacent edges. Um, here again, K is three. Okay. And that's, you need to go through the graph to see that. Alternatively, you can compute the spectrum and just do it. So here's the if and only if. So k is uh, g is k regular. If and only if the, sub, the squares of the uh, eigenvalues sum up to k times n. So maybe I do this for you uh, for this graph, and I leave the other graph as an exercise. So here you get 3 squared, and then we get 3 times 1 squared. 1 squared is a bit boring, obviously. And then we get 3 times minus one squared, uh, which is also just one squared, and minus three squared. So this is um, nine plus six plus nine, if I'm not 
completely mistaken, which hopefully should give 24. And 24 is three times eight, and we have eight vertices. So n is eight here, and a k is three, as I said. So, okay, so you do this simple calculation, just squaring the, uh, the eigenvalues and summing them, and you can check whether our graph is k regular. Again, an absolutely fabulous application. Just do it on the spectrum instead of staring at the graph and trying to get something out of the graph. And it gets better. So here you might argue that, okay, checking bipartite, not quite clear how difficult that is, but checking K regular is rather easy, you might complain. But there are things that are really, really difficult and the spectrum can tell you something about it. But if things are really difficult, then usually you only get some kind of form of an inequality. So the spectrum kind of bounces it from below, from above, from whatever. So um, a classical and really, really difficult question in graph theory is to detect uh, independent sets. So there's a co click. So it's just a set of pairwise non adjacent vertices. Just look at this graph here. Um, the blue ones are just non adjacent. And I would like to find the maximum number of non adjacent vertices. And that's called the independence number. And I will just denote it by alpha. So really easy setup. I just say it again because sometimes it's confusing. I look for the biggest number, so the maximal number of non-adjacent vertices in my graph. Uh, to find some non-adjacent vertices is easy. To convince yourself that you have the biggest number, I don't know, a little bit tough. So it's not quite clear how you do that. Um, so it's and it's a really difficult problem in general. So one of the most difficult problems in graph theory. And the spectrum can't solve it for you. That would be too good, but it can get you there by giving you an upper bound. And here's the formula. I just computed it up here. So here's my spectrum again, same setting as before. Now, because this graph has so many vertices, uh, this notation just that is, is not saying I have two to the six as a, an eigenvalue. I'm saying two appears six times. So the, the subscript here is saying how, how often it appears, right? Zero appears four times. And you just, it's pretty simple. You just take the maximal eigenvalue and the minimal eigenvalue, you multiply them together. Here, for example, you get a minus nine, and then you play around with this minus nine a little bit. And in this example, um, the, the number you're up for is eight and the bound you get is 12. So you only need to check uh, kind of that is not nine, 10 or 11. So spectrum is, uh, very, very helpful in this case. And this is a really difficult problem, which here you might say, okay, we get a beautiful answer, but these are also easy problems. Here we get a little bit of a, it's not a perfect answer, but it's, we can't expect the perfect answer because the problem is so difficult. And similarly here, it, it goes on. I mean, I just give you some examples, obviously, that I can fit in the roughly in a 10 minute video. Here's another example. It's about coloring of graphs. Um, so as you can see here, I have a, a graph and it has colors in it. As far as I can see, it has three colors. Um, yeah, so green, I guess, green, and then there's a blue color, and it looks like there's a red color. And if I'm not mistaken, that's it. And turns out that this is a, a maximal coloring. Again, the question is, can you color the vertices such that uh, adjacent vertices get different colors? So here, green, blue, green, and this vertex is red, right? So adjacent vertices get different colors. And we want to know now the minimal number possible, right? The minimal number possible. And this is, again, a very difficult problem in graph theory. And the spectrum essentially knows the answer. And it's really beautiful because now, now the formula is much easier. I kind of glossed a little bit over this formula. It's not difficult, obviously. I just, I just had it here. But now the formula is very simple. So an upper bound is achieved by one plus the maximal eigenvalue. One plus the maximal eigenvalue is four. So the upper bound is four in this case. And the lower bound is achieved by one minus the ratio of the maximal over the minimal. And if I haven't messed up, then this should be roughly 2.34. Since you know it can only take integer values, you can have three as the uh, uh, lower bound. So you have bounded the coloring between three and four, right? So you don't need to check everything anymore. You just need to make sure that you know whether it's three or four and the calculation to get you there was essentially trivial, right? So one plus lambda one, yeah, we can do that. Uh, one minus lambda one over lambda n, we can do that as well. 
And there are the restrictions here are essentially silly. If G is not edgeless, if you have an edgeless graph, you could color it easily. Let's not do that. That's boring. Um, if G is connected, well, if you, if you just do it per connect component. So harmless restrictions, beautiful bounds, really, really simple. And they get you there. Well, as you can see, quite often they're quite good. So here, there are only two, le two left to check, right? So you only would need to check three and four. That's pretty, it's pretty impressive. And it just goes on. I just was too lazy to do more or I'm running out of slides because eventually in a YouTube video, you should kind of quit after 10 minutes. That's what the YouTube guideline, uh, that's not a YouTube guideline, forget that. But anyway, that's kind of the rough guideline that you should do. Uh, at least my attention span drops after 20 seconds, but maybe I'm just completely retarded and yours is more like 10 minutes. But anyway, that's, the, I'm not saying, let me try again. I'm not saying that uh, my application's empty or the applications, I'm just saying, I'm stopping here because, well, you know, <laughs> there's only so much time. So there are, there are many, many, many problems. Um, there are variations and there are random walks and shannon capacity, which I will cover later. And it, it's just uh, absolutely great. So here's another variation. So um, another coloring variation. And you can try it on this graph if you want. So mult lambda n is the multiplicity of the smallest eigenvalue. So uh, three in this case. And the other formula is hopefully quite clear. Anyway, so I'm saying that there are millions of applications. I just can't do them in this video because I'm running out of time. Um, the main crucial application, and I will spend one whole video on this because it's just ridiculous uh, how, how powerful and how widespread and uh, important this application is, is the page rank algorithm, which is how Google essentially orders pages. Uh, or YouTube orders videos or whatever. So how did you get here? It's not unlikely that you either Google something or you on YouTube use some keywords or whatever. And the way this is ordered is again using um, the principal eigenvalue, eigenvector uh, of the matrix. So that's the parent for being eigenvector, which corresponds to the maximum of my lambda one eigenvalue. And essentially, just YouTube does compute this eigenvalue and what spits out is, well, the list that you will see. So if you Google whatever page rank, uh, the reason why page rank Wikipedia probably will end up as the first spot is that's how the page rank algorithm works. Anyway, I should definitely spend and I will a whole video on this because this is just a, a fantastic and a extremely important real world application of the spectrum. Anyway, so in this video, I had essentially three applications in graph theory itself to easy problems, you know, bipartite or irregular with beautiful solutions, namely if and only if, and to really difficult problems where we most of the time get kind of bound. Remember that the spectrum loses a little bit of information and that's where you can see it. But it's good that it loses a little bit of information because the spectrum is easy to compute. So you get those bounds easily while answering the question is just notoriously difficult. So you can kind of prove that it is difficult in a certain sense. Anyway, I hope you like the spectrum now. I hope you like this video and I also hope to see you next time.